Well, good evening to everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all to our evening service tonight, and a special welcome to the members of the Royal Black Preceptory, and to the band who have come with you. I enjoyed your music as you were coming up the road, and you're very welcome at our service this evening. I was just saying to my wife this afternoon as we were walking over from the manse to the church service this morning, she was saying, there was a very good crowd at church this morning. And I said, I reckon, I mean, that this side was full, and this side was full, and the back five or six, maybe seven rows were full. But there was nobody sitting here. So, gentlemen, if you want to come back next Sunday morning, <laughs> the church will be full. That would plug the gap. Uh, well, you're very welcome with us. I don't need to repeat any of the announcements. The folks here uh, knew what's on the bulletin and so on. So we worship God this evening as we bring our praise to him and we sing a psalm to begin, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. And let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithful promises to us. We thank you that you have promised to keep watch over us through the day and through the night. We thank you, Lord, that your care is constant and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And you will not let our feet slip you will not let the sun strike upon us by day, nor the moon by night. And so, Father, we have confidence to come into your holy presence this evening to worship you, to acknowledge that you are the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, and that you are the savior of sinners who put their trust in you. And so we come humbly into your presence and we confess our sin. We acknowledge that in word, in thought, in deed and in attitude. We fall short of your glory, and we are worthy and deserving only of your judgment and your justice. And yet we thank you that you have sent a Savior, the one who stood in our place, who hung in our place upon the cross, bearing our sin and shame. We thank you that his death and now his resurrection pays for all our sins. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather together in fellowship uh, from various places around this village and beyond. Thank you for our visitors who've come to share in worship with us this evening. And bless them. And bless us all, Lord, as we hear your word. May your spirit take its truth and apply it to our hearts to encourage us, to enlighten us, and above all, to bring us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our Bible reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, and uh, Amanda uh, is our reader this evening. Thanks, Amanda. Our lesson this evening is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Amanda. Now let's join together in our prayers for others and in our prayers uh, we will um, pray from the, the world and then pray for our own nation and then pray for our own family and those who are near to us. Our gracious God, we come to intercede with you for a world that is full of sorrow and need. There are places where there have been natural disasters, earthquakes and fires and floods, and many ordinary people just caught up in those things through no fault of their own or fault of anybody else's perhaps, and yet they are suffering, and we pray that you will draw near to them, and that you will help them. We pray for the agencies of whatever kind who are engaged in relief work. We pray for those who are trying to um, work long-term to improve the situation, to perhaps uh, mitigate against uh, floods and droughts, uh, trying to help the farmers to plant seeds that will grow even if there is a, a season without much rain and so be able to to feed themselves and their families. We pray too, Lord, for places where there's great suffering because of evil, because people are evil, because of sin and because of war and selfishness and greed. And Lord, there are so many places around the world where this is so, and sometimes A war conflict flares up in one place, and we hear about it on the news for a few days, perhaps. And then something else takes the news headlines, and and we forget. Perhaps many of us, a few weeks ago, were concerned about Sudan. And it's been little in the news this last week or two. And yet the conflict goes on, and many people are suffering. And again, Lord, we pray that you would graciously intervene in these places, 
and bring about peacemakers and <coughs> strengthen the hands of, of uh, governments who are trying to do the right thing, to be fair and just and to bring about resolutions to these conflicts. And then, our Father, we pray, too, for our own nation. We thank you, Lord, for our new king, and we pray your blessing upon him and all his family. We thank you for the uh, celebrations just a few weeks ago at his coronation, and we thank you for the, uh, the Christian message that came through that service uh, in Westminster Abbey. We pray, Lord, that uh, the truths that were told then will continue to abide in the king's heart and in the hearts and minds of the nation. Sadly, Lord, we recognize that that's not always true, and that as a nation, many have wandered away from your truth. And though the king was handed a Bible with the words that said, this is the greatest treasure on earth, there are few in our nation who truly believe that. And your word is much neglected and derided and scoffed at and ignored. And Lord, we pray that you will bring about a season of revival in this land, that there might once again be a turning toward you and to the standards of your word, to the truth of it, that people might seek for a savior to deliver them from their sins. And Lord, we see the uh, the breakdown of families and the increase uh, in uh, trouble within our, our nation in so many ways. We pray, O oh God, that you would be merciful upon us and draw us back to yourself. And we pray too, Lord, for our province here in Northern Ireland. We pray for those who have been elected to the councils just this week. We pray for an, uh, an outcome uh, at Stormont that will bring government back again. And we recognize uh, that uh, there are many problems and that even if the assembly was up and running and the executive functioning well, they would still struggle to uh, solve all those problems. But perhaps they might have a better chance of doing it than the civil servants and the few politicians from England who take charge at the moment. And so we pray that you would lead us and guide us in the days ahead. And then, Lord, finally, we pray for our own family. We, we pray, Lord, for this church and for all the churches in this village and round about. We pray, Lord, that you will draw near to those for whom in this quiet moment we want to say particular prayers. And there are those, Lord, who have lost loved ones in recent times, or maybe perhaps many years ago, but uh, today or this week is perhaps the anniversary of their passing and they are still deeply mourned. And then there, there are those who are sick. Uh, there are some from our congregation who are poorly at this time in hospital or in nursing homes. And no doubt amongst our brethren, there are family members and friends who likewise are in need of our prayers. And just in this quiet moment, Lord, before your throne of grace, we hold these folks up before you. And so, our Father, we offer up all these prayers in Jesus' name, knowing that for his sake you will hear us and answer according to your perfect will. Amen. And now uh, we will bring our offering to God, and all the loose offering in the service this evening uh, will go to the Lord in a skill and fund, and some of the brethren will lift up the collection now.
and we will sing together again, uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Rebecca, that would be a good hymn to sing when we had some extra male voices tonight. You sing very well, gentlemen. Eh? Very good. Not only can you come and fill the middle pews, you can come and join the choir as well. Now, uh, this evening I'm going to take an interesting parable from uh, Matthew chapter 20. Our visitors uh, won't know this, but we have been reading through the New Testament here in Cullibacky for the last uh, 13 weeks. Uh, we started, or 12 or 13 weeks, I think this is week 13 we're going into, just starting. And so uh, we've got, uh, I haven't got it in the pool with me, uh, but we've got a little setting of the, of the New Testament. And um, it's got all of the books in the New Testament, just in a slightly different order. So we started with Luke, and then read Acts, and then Paul's letters, and then uh, we read uh, Mark, and, and then we've been reading Matthew. The last two weeks we've been reading uh, Matthew. So it kind of gets us through the whole of the New Testament in 16 weeks. So we've got three weeks left. Uh, so this week coming, we'll be reading Hebrews and James. And then just the last bit is John. John's gospel and letters and the book of Revelation. So uh, this week, our folks have been reading all, hopefully, well, the last two weeks, they've hopefully read um, all of Matthew's gospel. And I have to say, it's been a great blessing. You can ask some of the folks here, whether they think it's been a good idea or not. Now, if they don't think it was a good idea, don't ask in my hearing because I don't want to hear that. Uh, but I, the feedback I've got, uh, and most people, I think, have been keeping up. And uh, so it, it's, been a, it's been a great blessing. Um, you know, we do all, if we're Christians, say we believe the Bible. I don't know that there'd be anybody who hardly would come to a church service and say um, they don't believe the Bible. And yet, there might be many of us who only read maybe a verse or two, or maybe we go to church on a Sunday and the preacher or somebody else reads a lesson, and, and that's all the Bible we, we hear through the week. Um, and of course, if the Bible is our spiritual food, um, what would it be if we only had one square meal a week? I know there are some people in the world and they're lucky to get one good square meal a day. Uh, but if we only had one meal a week, uh, well, some of us would be thinner than we are, wouldn't we, gentlemen? Yes. 
Uh, and spiritually, of course, it's no less true that if we don't read God's Word and allow God to take His Word and, and write it in our hearts and, and fill our minds and thoughts with us and, and, and use it as, a, as our, our guide, uh, then we miss out um, so much. Anyway, that's what we've been doing, and uh, I encourage you maybe to think of doing something similar, and maybe you can tell your minister about... I was in Cullibaki Methodist the other night, and I heard them, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can look it up online, and uh, it's, it's available. So, this parable in chapter 20 that Amanda read so beautifully for us earlier in the service is a, a well-known um, story uh, it's one that I have sometimes retold with a little trick that... Now, this will be new to all of the, most of the black men anyway. Uh, one or two of the Kalibaki Methodist people will have seen this before. But I, I do this little trick where I have a, a little short piece of string. And then I have another piece uh, that's a bit longer. And then the third piece is the longest one of all, you see. And when I fold them up, and uh, shake my wrist. Then I turn them into three ropes that are all the same size. Now, there's still three of them. There's one, there's two. There's I wish you could see these boys' faces. They look impressed. <laughs> That's good. Even more than the children are when I do it with them. And, of course, it illustrates one of the conundrums and puzzles in this parable. You see, there were some people who only worked for an hour. And there were other people who worked the whole length of the day, from 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening. 12 hours was probably that, what their shift was. And then some in between. But they all got paid the same. And it raises an interesting question. And indeed, on a Wednesday, we have a little Bible study group, mostly, in fact, all ladies apart from me, usually. Uh, and then the Bible study in the evening, and we've been just having a discussion about whatever we've been reading during the previous week. So we've been discussing bits of Matthew on Wednesday past. And indeed, there was uh, somebody in the afternoon group who asked this very question about this parable and said, that doesn't seem like it's fair. And that's a very strong instinct in most of us, if not all of us. And this is, it's, it's particularly striking when we're children. Now, some of you have got children, I don't doubt. Some of you, by the look of you, have got grandchildren. Um, any great grand? Anyway, no, I'll not push it. Uh, um, but you know what it's like when you've got a little toddler. Uh, suppose you had two grandchildren. Suppose you had three grandchildren. And you gave them each an ice cream. And you gave the little one a little tiny ice cream. And you gave the middle-sized one a fair size. And you gave the, the bigger one your favorite one because he's your first grandchild. You gave him a huge ice cream. What do you think the wee one's going to say? Granda, that's not fair. And I guess he's right. Wouldn't be fair to give one grandchild a lot, and maybe the other one, little or nothing. And kids somehow have a deep instinct for that, don't they? And you, not always, but usually, they're right. And sometimes a child will spot an injustice, something that's not fair, and they will say it. And, and sometimes they'll say it with a great deal of, of feeling. That's not fair. And when we look at the world around us, of course, with either children's eyes or maybe even more so when we have grown-up eyes and we have the intelligence and the experience and the wit to see it, there are lots of things in the world that seem not to be fair. Let me take you through briefly the details of the story and fix the details in our mind. This owner had a vineyard. Uh, like all of the Lord's parables, they are based on something that's in the real world. Uh, it was the harvest of grapes in September time. And there was a short window uh, during which you had to harvest the grapes. As soon as they were sweet enough, ripe enough, then you needed them picked uh, as quickly as possible. 
That was the, the reason for hiring extra workers and uh, why the, uh, the farmer was anxious to get as much labor as possible to get the grapes picked and in as quickly as possible. So it goes down to the market square, the hiring place where people would have stood waiting to be employed for the day, casual laborers. And he does a deal with the, man, the men uh, that, that he sees then at, at, at six in the morning. And he says, um, gentlemen, uh, go work in my vineyard and I will pay you a denarius. It was agreed, it was a contract. All be probably a, a verbal contract, but nonetheless, he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day's work. Now, uh, that was a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. That was the going rate for a laboring man uh, for a day's work, a denarius. At the third hour, at uh, nine o'clock, uh, midday, late afternoon, he goes out and he sees some others. Uh, at nine in the morning, he went and saw others and he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. Okay, so there's no formal contract this time. He doesn't agree what he will pay. He just says, I'll pay you what's right. So no doubt in their heads, if a full day's pay would be a denarius, then they would get, I don't know, whatever three quarters of a denarius would have been. Okay, but the, the, that's probably what was in their heads. Uh, the ones later in the day, they're not told anything. They just said, uh, you're, you're going to work. And, and some of them say, well, why have you been here all day? And, and they say, well, nobody hired us. Um, it raises the question as to where they were at 9 o'clock or 6 o'clock. Maybe they were still in their beds. Maybe they were late risers. But anyway, uh, they were still willing to work. And perhaps it was a sign of their desperation that they held on until almost the end of the day, even to get one hour's work in uh, that's to their, to their credit, I don't doubt. Then it comes to pay time. And the master of the vineyard tells the foreman, whose job it was to hand out the wages, to do what he's about to do. And he says, um, pay the guys who came in last, pay them first. So the ones who just worked for an hour came, and they got their pay. Now, whether it was in a wee packet or whether it was just doled out, we don't know. But imagine it was a wee packet, uh, like some of you boys remember years ago when you got your first pay packet, you know, a little brown envelope. Yes, I see, so you're nodding. Yeah, and and, and they, they open it up, and they looked inside, or maybe they tipped it out of their hand, and they went, ooh, it was a whole denarius for an hour's work. That was a good pay rate, I tell you. That was above minimum wage. And then the ones uh, who were there for three hours, they got the same. And the ones earlier, uh, midday, they got the same. So then the ones who'd started work at six in the morning and worked the whole long day in the heat of the day, they came to get their wages. And somehow word it got sort of, you, you imagine the buzz going around, uh, the crowd of men who are heading for home. So they'd obviously got wind that the guys who started late in the day got paid in denarius. So, logically, they thought, well, it would only be fair, wouldn't it, to get more than that? And then when they got their pay packets, <coughs> oh, long faces, it was just one denarius. And they complained. And then he answers them, uh, verse uh, 13, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Yes, that was the contract. They had agreed. And it wasn't coercion. It wasn't that they'd done a bad deal at the beginning of the day. That was fair. And they got what they deserved. Take your pay and go home. He says, if don't I have the right to do with my own money what I want? Well, of course you do. Or are you envious because I am generous? Interesting phrase in the Greek. Uh, do you have an evil eye? Is your eye evil? It's just a way of saying, uh, are, you, are, you, are you jealous? 
You got green eyes because, because I am generous? Well, now, there's an interesting story. What are we to, to make of it? Let me suggest that we think about three things briefly. The first two are of some significance, though uh, perhaps you'll guess as I go along that it's not the main point of the story. First of all, there's something in this story that we can extrapolate about work. The owner of the vineyard went out to, to hire workers. Now, some of you no doubt are retired, but uh, given that uh, you have some measure of, of health and so on, um, I guess all of you will have been working men of some kind at some point, uh, maybe for many years. Some of you still are, I'm sure, still working. Um, and work is good. Work was ordained by God. And if you go back to the very beginning in Genesis, when God made Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, he gave them work to do. Following the pattern that God had set, because God did the work of creation, rested on the Sabbath day, the seventh day. The tending of the garden in Eden was Adam and Eve's work. These creatures, these people made in the image of God, shared some of God's creativity. Work also gave them a sense of responsibility, something that they were to do. It gave them also a sense of significance. Interesting, when you, when you meet somebody for the first time, what's one of the first questions you might ask them? You might ask them lots of different questions, but, but one of the questions you quite often ask or get asked is, uh, what you do? And then you say you're a, a bus driver or a, a plumber or a doctor or a Methodist preacher or whatever it is, uh, and your, your work gives you some um, significance. And it's a hard thing then if you're unemployed and have been unemployed or can't work for health reasons or other things, and, and you don't have an occupation, as well as responsibility and creativity and significance. Work gives us a sense of fulfillment. I'm sure you men could think of many a time when you've sat down after a hard day's work, in whatever field it is you work, and you've done a good job well, and you think to yourself, I did that well, and you feel good. It gives you a sense of fulfillment. You might be tired. Uh, your hands might be sore or your head might be sore or whatever bits you've been using to work hard. But you're glad to have done it. And it's far better than sitting around on your backside all day doing nothing. I mean, we all like to sit down now and again, and we all need a rest, of course. But if we never had the opportunity to do anything of significance, well, how feeble and empty our lives would be. And of course, it was only... It was only after Adam and Eve sinned that their work became labor and God cursed the ground and caused the thistles and thorns to grow up and said, by the sweat of your brow, you will earn your living. That doesn't, that doesn't undermine the significance of work, of course. It just adds this extra dimension that for a season, for now, for this world, it can be difficult labor. And of course, in the parable, we see the owner of the vineyard didn't want men standing around idle doing nothing. He wanted to give them employment. Now, perhaps his motive was to get his grapes in. That's true. And yet, also, it was to the benefit of those who were employed. God values our work. And when you go off to work in the morning, or whenever it is you go to work, or if you're retired, whatever, even when you're retired, there's still stuff to do. I dare say looking after grandchildren can be hard work. I don't have any yet, so, but I'm looking forward to that time when I, I can work hard looking after grandchildren. Uh, it's a great reward in so many things. The second thing in the parable, though, that strikes us is this question of 
of time served and payment received. Just like the little um, rope trick. Uh, some only worked for an hour. Some worked the whole day long. Different lengths of service, and yet the same reward. Uh, some people think that this was um, told, at least in part, in answer to what uh, Peter has said at the end of chapter 19, the previous um, chapter, um, when they have been talking about um, the kingdom of God. And, and Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. Will there be a reward for us? And Jesus has given them a, a, a very telling answer. He says, I tell you the truth, that the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits in his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. First, many who are first will be last and who are last will be first. It's possible that Jesus has that in mind, and particularly because that same phrase appears at the end of this story. So the first will be, the last will be first, the first will be last. And yet, somehow, I think perhaps Peter's already got the full answer at the end of chapter 19. So maybe that's not, um, that's not the case. Maybe Jesus is looking ahead Perhaps he can see in his mind's eye a companion that he will have beside him on the cross. There were two of them, of course. At first, they both mocked him. But then one of them saw sense and realized that this man on the middle cross was an innocent man suffering for sins that he had not committed. And says to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. How long was that man a Christian? Well, you would count it in hours, wouldn't you? Before he died, and he was with Christ in glory that very day. Perhaps he was thinking, too, about what would have been inconceivable to those Jewish disciples in the crowd and those around him, of a day when a host of Gentiles People from far away distant places, pagan places like, like Kalibaki, who would be brought into God's kingdom and would share the same salvation that the Jewish disciples did, that the thief on the cross did. Perhaps you've been saved for 50 years. Don't despise the little girl who was saved last week. You share the same salvation. Perhaps some of you, before you were converted, were miserable wretches and lived filthy lives. Perhaps others were much more upright and moral and maybe saved at an early age before you could get into those grievous kinds of sins. Your salvation is the same. God has saved you and set you apart. This is a, a glorious gospel. And maybe the old rope trick does have a truth in it. Uh, little sinners, middle-sized sinners, and big sinners. There's a story that usually goes with the rope trick. We all share the same salvation because Christ has died for us all and we are redeemed by his grace. All of that said, Perhaps we haven't quite yet got to the nub of this little parable, the heart of the story. It surely comes in this dispute at the end. When those who were hired early got the same wage that the ones who'd worked all day. And when the ones who'd worked all day got the denarius, then they complained. And they said it wasn't fair There are two great truths implicit in this parable. Truths about the character of God 
And they are these. That God is absolutely fair and just. That's number one. The second truth that sits beside this first one is that God is also remarkably generous and gracious. Let me just say a word or two about each of those. He is just. We have this sense, as I say, from childhood, that things should be fair. And, of course, we know that we live in a world where so much is not fair. And people sometimes turn that on God and say, why does God allow those things to happen? There is much of that that we can't yet answer. But I contend this, that God is fair. And God is just. The fact that he doesn't execute his justice fully just yet is a mercy to us, is it not? For if God had fulfilled justice the first day that we sinned and struck us down, none of us would have been saved. The wages of sin is death, says Paul in Romans 3, 26. The wages. Your wages are what you deserve. You work hard all week, and your boss gives you your pay packets. And hopefully, well, maybe you might have a bit of a bonus. If there was a bit of a bonus in it, you wouldn't complain about that. That's, uh, you would be glad of that. Uh, but if he paid you less than you were supposed to pay, and maybe he only paid you for half the hours you worked, you would be complaining. You'd be onto the union, and you'd say, that's not fair. Your wages are what you deserve. Well, all of us are sinners. And the wages that our sin deserves is death. These are serious and solemn things. Some people say, how can a loving God send people to hell? In our parable this morning, we were talking about, about that, about being cast out into the darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, being shut out from the kingdom. How can God condemn people to hell if he's a loving God? Well, the answer is very simple. God is just. And how can a just God not punish sinners? God's character demands this justice. A friend of mine uh, who writes lots of very catchy little tracts, he had a great one a number of years ago with a, a little um, caption on the front which said, The good news is so good. Because the bad news is so bad. The bad news is that we deserve God's judgment. That is the wages of our sin. And you can see then why it was necessary that we have the cross. Where God could in justice punish our sins. When Jesus, our substitute, stood in our place. There's one of uh, Mr. Wesley's hymns that we don't sing much these days, and it's not in the more modern Methodist hymn books. But I have it in this old, very old one. Uh, uh, the first line or verse or two say this, "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice, the great redeeming work is done. "'Tis finished, all the debt is paid, justice divine is satisfied. God's justice is satisfied. As in another modern hymn that puts it uh, by Getty and Townhend, uh, the wrath of God was satisfied at the cross. God is just. The second thing, though, is that God is gracious. God is merciful. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. In his grace, he offers to us his only son to be our savior. The story about a mother in the time of Napoleon whose son had committed some crime or other 
and she came to the emperor to plead for her son's life. And Napoleon apparently said to the woman, this boy has done such and such, and he deserves to die. The woman said, your highness, or whatever way Napoleon was supposed to be addressed, he said, I, I know that. He said, but I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. And Napoleon spared the lad. God is remarkably gracious. God has mercy and will not punish us as our sins deserve. That's what mercy is. When you don't get what you deserve, that's mercy. But God is more than that. He is gracious. And grace is when you do get something that you don't deserve. And none of us deserve God's salvation. You know the other half of that verse I quoted a moment ago from Romans 6 and 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. That is God's gracious, loving attitude towards sinners who repent. Those who started the day at six in the morning had an, an agreement, a binding agreement. They had a contract, albeit verbal. Uh, Denarius, yes, we'll work for that for the day. That was the deal. And they got what they deserved. Now you can, in one sense, enter into a kind of contract with God. You can say, well, I will keep the law, and I will obey your commandments, and I will do everything that you command, and then I'll get what I deserve. Now, in theory, if you kept all God's commandments, you would deserve to have eternal life. The truthful reality, of course, is that none of us have been able to or can keep all God's law. The others who came later had no contract. They had to trust in the generosity of the landlord. And that's the position that you and I are in. We are dependent upon God's grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God. It's not of works. It's not by your own doing. So no one can boast about it. If you ever come across a Christian who is boastful about their salvation, well, something's not quite right. They haven't understood it properly. You are saved by God's gracious, generous heart. Martin Luther said, The saved are singled out not by their own merit, but by the grace of the mediator. And of all the things that this story is about, and no doubt we could perhaps draw out other things as well, but that's more than enough for one evening. The chief thing is this, that God is fair. But God is more than fair. God is just, but God is remarkably gracious. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a gospel of grace. When God gives to us things that we don't deserve, simply for the asking and the trusting in him. And if any of you this evening have not yet put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you come like these guys who only worked for an hour and hold out your hands and receive from the gracious hands of God the forgiveness of all your sins and the Holy Spirit to dwell in your heart and lead you and guide you and eternal life. It is the gift of grace. Amen. I'm going to sing our closing song. This is a newer one. Uh, I'm sure many of you will know it nonetheless. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer?
just after the benediction, we will remain standing and sing the national anthem. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each one of you this evening and forevermore. Amen. Two years, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming tonight.